I heard doozers back there, too. They're not just in the Orange Julius stand. You're so silly. Um, I think it, this is such a, when I saw that we were doing this topic tonight, I was excited because I really think that it allows us to talk a lot about like kind of what the whole goal of our training and why we do what we do. And, you know, obviously we want to help you to have a, a well-behaved four-legged family member. That's our, our tagline, of course. However, it's like a, a lot bigger than that. You know, if your dog is able to listen outside, the world of experiences that you get to have with your dog expands exponentially um you know if you have a dog that has a a nose to to listen well and not pull on the leash and to come when they're called you're going to feel more comfortable and more confident giving that dog freedom which means you're going to want to do stuff with them more you know we love to do stuff with our dogs and because they listen well we can easily hike them um i've mentioned this many times before but i like to paddleboard with my dogs and you know i can take them out on the paddleboard and they can go off in the water and i know they're not going to take off and bug somebody Um, having really good control and a really strong working relationship with your dog um, and them wanting to listen to you gives you a little bit more opportunity to spend more time with them so that you're not embarrassed to take your dog for a walk or you're actually enjoying spending time with them and you don't have a dog that just you know takes up time in the backyard and doesn't really get to do a lot of fun things so you know this is really important we want to give you the tools so that you're motivated to work towards having a dog that listens to learns to listen everywhere and the reason why we dedicated a whole stream to outside is because it's just harder than getting your dog to listen inside you know the house where there's not as many distractions let me know i've seen a couple people uh hey welcome uh congratulations on becoming a heart dog supporter welcome to the heart dog team nancy foglia thanks um let me know what your what your dog age and breed is and one real struggle when you're outside. Um, I think it'll be helpful. We can also make references to your specific situation. But let us know uh, dog uh, age and breed. And then uh, one struggle that, when you're working outside. I think something that's really important to note, and it's something that I think a lot of people misunderstand, is that simply going outside, here's the first tip, simply going outside adds an extra layer of difficulty. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? You know, what does that mean in your training? Let's talk a little bit about how we like set the dog up to be successful in a, an unpredictable environment or a busy environment. Well, if we dial it back a little bit more, what we would also do is we would make sure that if we were ready to set out to an outside environment where maybe we can't control everything around us, whatever I set out to do, I would have already practiced and um, worked through as much as I possibly can in a controlled environment. So if I want to teach my dog to do something new, I'm probably not going to drive to the park when there's like a bunch of baseball games and stuff going on and teach my dog this brand new thing because my dog's going to be like, you know, the exorcist head just totally distracted by everything that's going on. What I would do um, to set the dog up to be more successful is make sure that I've perfected things in an environment that's a bit more controlled. And maybe that could be in the house. Maybe it could be in, you know, our yard. Ken and I have like a fenced in area at uh, at, uh, our home um, where we can train the dogs because it's fully fenced and there's no animals that are gonna come randomly running through. It's a great way to kind of bridge the gap between being outside and then maybe being closer to the road, for example. So you really need to think about Um, giving your dog some experience with whatever you want them to do, however they're going to listen to you, in a place that's less uh, distracting so that when you do go out and add more distractions, it's not just, you know, absolute chaos. If, if, If there's too much temptation, change your location is basically what a lot of that boils down to. I love to come up with that right now. I did. I did. Wow. But if, if there's, you know, what, what, Kale's talking about building relationship, building an understanding that, you know, you need to show your dog that you're worth listening to. And that might mean setting up the basics indoors, you know, setting up the basics in your garage, in your underground parking, in a locate, in your hallway, wherever. You need to teach your dog that, listen, buddy, if you remain in at my side, there's something good in it for you. Mm -hmm. Um, It's, 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 challenging but I've, I probably have made these mistakes myself before I you know before I became a trainer or started training at McCann dogs 
But it's so easy to think like, well, this this isn't you know this isn't working. I, I don't know what it is. I can't. It's he just loves kids. Or my dog's or just, stubborn. Or yeah, my dog's stupid. One hundred percent. Yeah, it's so easy to dis discount uh, or discredit the uh, breed. You know, to say like, mm-hmm. oh, it's because he's a lab. He needs to grow up to be two years old before they can start to train. I've learned uh, having helped thousands of dogs personally as a trainer that is not the case. The students and you, if you understand that building a foundation in a quieter environment. If you really understand the value in that, then you're setting yourself up to be more successful when you get into more challenging situations. But you have to start at the foundation. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I can't stress that enough. I saw uh, several people are um, have mentioned like everything. When I go outside, it doesn't matter what it is, the dog's distracted. Mm-hmm. I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we can change that starting tonight. The bad news is your dog doesn't think you're very interesting. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, that relationship idea and how to elevate that person in this situation so that the dog is choosing them more often. Yeah, I need to learn about what my dog likes. Um, You know, and I don't just mean like food, treats. Treats are a great thing to use. You know, we do a lot of treat training uh, with our dogs um, with the eventual goal that our dog learns to listen even when we don't have treats or food on us. But there's other things that I want to know about my dog just besides what their favorite treat would be. It might be um, how they like to play or um, are they really distracted by motion, for example. There's some breeds that maybe are more herding style breeds and they're more attracted to like things that move around while there's other dogs dogs that that doesn't bother them quite as much Mm -hmm. so for a dog that's very motion driven motion sensitive you're going to have a harder time around you know animals moving leaves blowing (laughs) cars going by the end of the driveway Um, knowing a little bit more about your dog will help you to make some better decisions about what you want to go out there to do Mm -hmm. also like can you play with your dog? That's another thing. I find a lot of time when people go outside to do some training and, you know, if I'm watching them, I think like I've had naps more exciting than what what they're doing with the dog. You know, you need to learn how to engage a dog because if you're up against some tough distractions, if you're not using a lot of voice or if you're not using your body, your body language or, or motion yourself, sometimes the dogs sort of say, well, you don't really look like a lot of fun, so I'm going to go on and do something else. So it's important that you learn about your particular dog so that you can figure out how to get them interested in working for you in the first place. Yeah, I know uh, one of the Hartog team said, uh, Deborah said, 10 week old Ozzy, uh, mostly disengaged even with a treat on her nose. Yeah. So uh, now, the mistake that you might make, Deborah, is to think, oh, my dog's not interested in food or food's not working, um, and just completely stop using food in that situation. How can we troubleshoot with a 10 week old Aussie at 10 weeks old, um, working through this sort of distraction for Deborah? Well, the good news is you have a baby puppy on your hands that at 10 weeks old is not gonna have very many skills yet. No. Um, but at the same time, it's a wonderful age because now you can really start to to show your dog and teach your dog what to do. Um, you know, if dogs aren't um, super motivated by food, A couple easy suggestions, general suggestions, could be change up the food that you're using. Try to use something that's a bit more motivating. Um, If I'm up against some harder distractions, I'm going to try not to stick to like my dog's regular kibble. I'm going to try and go to something that's much more higher value. Maybe I cut up some block cheese or I cut up some hot dog wieners or um, some leftover chicken or hamburger from the night before. Something that's going to be extra special and exciting. Um, The other thing that I'm going to do to build more value um, for food would be maybe practice when my dog's hungry. Um, I might skip breakfast and put some of their breakfast in a little Ziploc bag with a couple extra goodies. And I might go outside with myself armed with that um, to, to help that food be a little bit more helpful. But again, we can't force a dog to want food we can try to make the food more exciting like some of the things i've suggested i could literally go on all day with more suggestions than that but that's just a couple um but i also have the opportunity to control other things as well so i can maybe look at the distance that i am from the distraction or maybe what i'm asking my dog to do in that moment is too challenging maybe just start with something simple sit on a loose leash forget the walking forget the attention while you're moving that's actually very challenging you want to work towards that just work on sit or maybe go out and try to do 
Um, your dog's favorite trick. Maybe they are amazing at something in the house. Shake a paw, spin. Go outside and try some of those things first to see if you can get more success. Yeah, um, Nico, Fer, 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 Fergione, uh, turning the lights in the train, train station green um, along the same lines. But oh. We can talk a little bit about this. Nico says, we got an eight-week-old uh, cockapoo last week. Love your house line product. I just, need to, I just need him to find his food more valuable. He was free-fed at mm. the breeder. Cool. So let's. Uh, do you have any tips for making food more valuable outside of the ones? This is something that um, actually instructor Carol and I were chatting about this idea not that long ago in making food more fun. So sometimes introducing a couple things you need to be mindful of. Don't are, are you overfeeding the dog and having some expectations of training treats? We talk about portioning out the food. Were you, did you mention that? Mm, a little bit. Make sure you're not, you know, feeding your dog their full breakfast if you're going to train in mid-morning. Or, you know, you're not feeding them their full dinner and then going out and having some expectation that they'll be hungry after. Um, but also, you can make food a little bit more interesting. You know, you can put it in a toy. You can uh, make it move. You know, when your dog, uh, you know, is moving around, you can throw it between your legs. They can chase it. Sometimes these little tweaks can make all the difference in the world. Along with a lot of the things that Kale mentioned earlier, Nico, you'll be doing those exact same, mm -hmm. you'll be following those exact same steps. So you're going to find that helpful. But uh, making sure that uh, you didn't really say whether or not you're meal feeding now, but if he was free fed before, stop it. Um, go right to meal feeding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another real advantage of meal feeding is that you can you can m m monitor the ins and the outs, and that's really important with mm -hmm. a puppy. How much is going in? How much is coming out? If you have a like a, a, a ratio mix up, you have a problem. Yeah. So knowing that your puppy's still hungry, knowing that they're having regular bowel movements and these kinds of things, really helpful for not only you know your understanding of the dog's health, but like. You know, are we feeding this puppy too much? You know, is, is everything okay with their guts? It, mm -hmm. it's, it's good for you to know those things. Yeah, and sometimes if a dog has been used to being free fed, I mean, your puppy's not very old, only eight weeks old, um, and then you try to switch to um, meal uh, meal feeding, it can take a little bit of time. Yes. You just have to be diligent with it. Um, a healthy dog is not going to go hungry. So right. if you just try to get the dog on a bit more of a schedule and limit the amount of time that your dog or your puppy has to eat, and then if they don't touch it, take it up and then put it back down for you know lunch or dinner or however many times you're feeding your dog. Um, in my experience, because I've moved dogs myself from um, uh, free fed to meal fed, it usually just takes a couple days and then you should be ready to go. Liz uh, Jennings Bowen, one of our hard dog team, said toot toot. And we yeah. haven't tooted in a long yeah, time. Yeah, but you should have given Nico a toot because oh, yeah. he did a super chat. And for Nico. Yeah. Two toots in a row. Man, you will not tooting see more tooting on a live stream on YouTube than you will in the train station. So I want you to know that high value food is really good. Kel talked about um, talked about uh, you know changing up what you're feeding your dog in this training session. Actually, some training sessions will actually suggest this to our life skills one students as well. Bring a few different things. Keep it interesting for your dog. You know, you'd get bored if you had pizza every meal in the day or you know several days. Nah, that's not true for me. You, I get that's bored. True for me, is it? I have, to have get something bored. different every day. Yeah, it's true. You'd get bored of your food eventually. Mm -hmm. The dogs are the same way. So keep it interesting uh, to maintain some of their attention. But food is great, high value food, but it's not everything. We need to talk a little bit about using some motion. Kale alluded to it a little bit. Can I stop you just for yeah, one second? Yeah. Um, I was just, we did a video um, a few Saturdays ago um, where I worked with a dog named Euchre. And um, the oh, video. Yeah was um, kind of about training outside, but it was also kind of about dogs who aren't that motivated with food and how to deal with dogs around a lot of distractions. And in the video, you see that I actually use a toy with her quite a bit because yeah. Euchre likes food, but loves a toy. And when she's out by the road and cars go by, she's very excited by that. Sometimes using food just isn't enough. So I don't know, maybe... Um, uh, Dan could share that video with everybody because it would be a really good thing to reference. It it sort of speaks to a lot of the things that we're talking about tonight. But yeah, it's great, um, yeah. food isn't the only thing. You have um, your voice, like we mentioned before, motion, which we're going to get into in just a second, but also other types of reward. Maybe, you know, your dog's favorite tug toy or whatever it might be. Um, you, you just you need to do something that gets the dog to go, huh, that seems interesting. That actually seems more interesting than that distraction over there. And then um, it will be a little bit easier. Thanks, Dan. Lots of loots, lots of loots, links. 
don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of links. Dropping the links. Um, dropping the loot. I, I, I should mention right uh, at this point, we get a lot of comments, or we see a lot of comments and get emails and things that say like, "Well, you know, I have a two-year-old insert specific breed here, and um, I just got had no training, but you know." you've been publishing puppy videos lately. Uh, it's really important to understand. And I know this might be confusing. Maybe if, uh, as, as dog trainers, we get this. It's not about your dog's age. It's about their stage of training or their level of understanding. So if you, if you, can, you okay? Just you and the rhymes. Like yeah, it's just, that's it, it. If it, it makes me laugh. I do love rhyming all of the time. And yeah, that, that felt sure. No, um, I appreciate the effort. Understanding your dog's level of, uh, uh, you know, really appreciating your dog's level of understanding. You know, um, whether, it doesn't matter the age of the dog. If you're working on foundational response to name, you need to start at the puppy steps. You need to start at the ground floor and really like loading value on their name. If you're struggling with leash walking, it doesn't matter how old the dog is or what their breed is. You're going to work on the foundational mm -hmm. stuff to build, a, you know, an understanding to remain in at my side and don't pull on leash, et cetera, et cetera. To that, uh, actually, I'm not going to take us in a different direction quite yet, but um, we talked about food. We know its value. We know how great it is for rewarding very specific things in very pr precise positions. Kale talked a little bit about motion, and mm -hmm. this could be the thing that unlocks, uh, you know, success for a lot of you at home. So understanding that, uh, number one, I should preface this with, I saw a lot of people saying, well, I can't control my dog when we're outside. They just go off and they eat sticks or they eat leaves or they do things that I don't want them to. Well, if you're having that kind of struggle right now, then your dog mustn't have an opportunity to be re to be reinforced by those things. Mm -hmm. You need to manage them better, whether that means a long line, maybe it's an outdoor long line, maybe it's a leash, probably going to be your best option right now and you go out with them. But at this point, you need to really increase your management so that if they do make a mistake, which they will because they're mm -hmm. young dogs. This is the thing the dog trainers get. Mm -hmm. They know dogs are going to make mistakes, but they're also, they also know exactly what to do when they happen. So if you're out there with them and your dog makes a mistake, totally expected, then you'll be able to do something about it. And in this case, we're going to talk a little bit about motion. And this is going to be really valuable for anybody who's struggling with uh, distractions, outdoor distractions on walks. Mm -hmm. We filmed a video a little, this is maybe a few years old, I'm not really sure, but it's the most appropriate for you guys. Do you want to listen in here? With I would head, head love nothing more. So, do I want a headbud? Earbud? Ear, earbuds? I thought you were going to headbutt me. Oh, I don't think so. Another really common challenge okay. that people... So this talks a little bit about motion. It's also going to talk about turning. So if you're struggling with leash walking, pay close attention to the points in this video. People have, and it makes it more difficult for their puppy is they don't know what the right pace of walking is. It's pretty easy for you as a handler to get focused on all of the technique when you're teaching this skill. You're, you're trying to keep the leash loose. You're trying to reward in a, in a specific position. You're trying to keep an eye out for uh, all of the distractions in the rear. Let me know if you felt like this. How many people feel like this when they're out trying to train their dog? You know, they're you, you think you're ready and you've got all the things in your head and then you get out there and you're like, what on earth am I doing? I am so overwhelmed. This is completely bonkers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I you know, it's it, that's how I felt too. I get it. it and it's uh, overwhelming and frustrating and, and you just want some strategies. So let's continue on. Real world. So it's not uncommon for people to really slow down their pace. And the problem is that this actually makes it a lot harder for your puppy. What you need to do is find the right pace. And it's not too fast and it's not walking <laughs> too slow, but it's a pace where your dog's paying a little bit more attention to you. I want you to walk like you're late for something. The great part about this is that your dog finds it motivating and, and, and entertaining if you're walking at a very specific pace and you're way more likely for the next 10 or 15 feet to get that great attention. Okay, so the idea that you're overwhelmed and you're, you know, you're thinking about so many different things that you naturally start walking slower. Super common, but what do you think happens? Now that your dog, you're not that interesting to your, you're less interesting to your dog at this point, and now your dog has an opportunity to like put their little nose on the ground, especially if you have, you know, a, a, a real uh, scent hound of a dog, or they see a, uh, they see motion off in the distance. You're not that interesting, but that thing running across the park really is. Finding the right pace for your leash walking training can be the thing that unlocks success for you. Um, now, I think we probably talk a little bit about going too fast, which can also, you know, not be that helpful. But mm -hmm. I'll tell you, 
the amount of times that we tell a student like, hey, pick it up, let's go a little faster, a little faster as we're coaching them. Yeah. Uh, and you see the dog just lock in all of a sudden. So be mindful. I want you to be really mindful of your pace. Mm -hmm. The other thing it does is it doesn't allow your puppy to uh, discover those things on the ground or be so focused on a leaf that blows by or a car that drives by off in or the distance. And, and it allows you to really maintain some of that attention for these short walking sessions. So make sure you pick a good pace. While we're talking about attention and focus. Now the next one is something that I think uh, some people have, um, have uh, struggled with a little bit because I've seen, <laughs> I've seen people uh, not when I was in dog trainer mode, but I was uh, working. I work uh, for the fire department. We drive around a lot, all hours of the night and day. And I've seen people like, like a spinning top on the sidewalk, trying to get <laughs> some control of their dog. Unfortunately, it's usually on a harness, and it makes it a little bit harder to give them good information. Yeah. But regardless, um, using turning, using turns in your leash walking training uh, can be super, super advantageous. You just have to use them right. And we're going to talk yeah. a little bit about how turns can reconnect your dog with you. Don't be afraid to use turns in your walking on leash training. This is a really nice way to, for those dogs that love to charge out. If your puppy charges ahead all the time, you can just do a 180 degree turn and head back in the other direction. Now at the beginning of this training, you can reward your puppy as they get back in at your side, as they get you know into that nice walking position. But what it does is it keeps it fun for your puppy. It allows them to, they, they're not really sure where you're going, so they're checking in with you more often. You wouldn't want to turn into a spinning top if your puppy's constantly charging ahead but for those puppies who walk in at your side some of the time and then they start to lead ahead just a little bit 180 degree turn is a great way to get more focus back on you another another really common challenge that people have and it makes it okay um i've seen a couple things here uh shanti fritz says i'm unable to walk fast what suggestions do you have well just uh you hang on Shanti, we're going to get into some more uh, suggestions if you can't walk quickly. Uh, Maureen mentions, when I had our puppy outside tonight, there was a woodpecker going from tree to tree and a chipmunk with a leave it at command. He ignored both. I was so proud. <gasps> These are the moments, you know. Wow. These are the moments that you feel good about uh, That's like when you get some success. double distractions. Yeah. Um, wow. Sue K, well, you guys really stepped up with the technology. Cool. Way to go. Hey, thanks. Sue, so I do. We do enjoy making uh, the train station more fun each and every week. Um, using turns, using motion, getting your, your, you are competing against all of the other things in the world. And when you're out training your dog, especially when you're walking, especially when you're walking in a public space. Um, I also just want to say like how important it is to use like motion away from the dog. Okay. Because, um, even the other day I was working with somebody on, um, teaching the dog to play fetch so that they could more easily exercise the dog and she would throw the toy for the dog the dog would grab the toy and then it would try to run away from her and as soon as i said call the puppy's name and run away to get the puppy to chase you the puppy immediately turned around and just ran right to the handler because the puppy just wants to to chase and the same thing happens for your recall you know if your puppy um or dog doesn't matter um, you know, wants to move away from you, the worst thing you can do is chase after your dog because they just think that it turns into a big game and sort of puts them in the driver's seat. So motion, again, um, not just for walking, but for recalls as well. When you call them, run away. Yeah. We'll see us reference a really fun game that we play with our dogs called Restraint Recalls. And this is an exercise that we work on outside so that we can have lots of space and we'll stand in front of the dog with a toy or a their favorite treat we'll have a family member hold the dog we'll stand in front and tease them and then we'll call come or their name and we'll run away from the dog and that promotes a lot of chase drive from them and they come racing after us once they catch us we have a great big game of tug or we give them a little jackpot of treats and the dogs just think my gosh you're cheering you're running i'm chasing you you're giving me treats there literally couldn't be anything better in the world than you and it builds so much value but um that game is built on the premise of motion mm -hmm. um which is why it's so effective oh isn't it fun isn't it remarkable when you see a dog a young dog that gets into a situation we get these mm -hmm. calls a lot at the office um someone will call our office staff and say like hey i'm in like week three or lesson three of your training program mm -hmm. And uh, the dog, my uncle, opened the door and Scooter ran right out to the road. I said, come. He darted right back, like enthusiastically, quickly. It's so much fun to watch the, again, the McCann method is all about motivation. 
What do you need to do mm-hmm. to get your dog uh, motivated to listen, excited about recalling back toward you, interested in walking beside you, less interested in those other dogs, less interested in those other people, really building relationship. And uh, the restraint recall is something we'll do from literally like the second or third day we'll mm-hmm. have a puppy. It's yep. something we'll do with our uh, life skill students like the first week. So that we they do start- it in Puppy Essentials too. That's right, in Puppy yep. Essentials. Like this is you, if you're not if you're not doing this even randomly it doesn't matter the it, age yeah. of dog dogs love it um so why not do the things that they already love like why not and maybe you're saying like well maybe um food my dog's not interested in food perfect use a toy this is when you want to break out those fun toys get them to engage in a game of tug maybe you say my dog's not that interested in toys Bring out that food. Use that high-value food. Maybe you can do a combo. We actually sell our uh, leash, uh, uh, our food retrieve, food tug trainer, specifically for those dogs to get them more interested in playing with toys because mm-hmm. it's such a valuable tool for teaching something like the recall. And it's not just about the skill. It's about them understanding that you are exciting, you're fun, and it's really great when I do get to you. Um, mm-hmm. I want to me- uh, answer Sue Kay. On our heart dog team, uh, are you supposed to look at your dog when walking or watch where you are going? That's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, Sue, the answer is both. Yeah. <laughs> you want to, um, you know, we should check in with your dog and you should be watching your dog, you know, fairly closely when you're walking because you want to be able to have good timing if they disengage from you or if their position starts to become poor so that you can, you know, address that. Or if they do something amazing, you want to be able to say yes and reward your dog, especially during training. Um, But, you know, we're not going to go for an entire walk staring at our dog and not being able to pay attention to where we're going. So the answer truly is both. Um, I sort of find myself, if I am working with a dog and I'm around maybe a bit more distractions, I would say that I tend to um, engage with my dog a little bit more during those moments and then in situations where you know the walk is maybe a bit more casual there's not as much going on maybe I'm not being so nitpicky with my position and I'm sort of doing more leash respect um, then I might not watch the dog quite as much I might relax a little bit so you can kind of move you know in and out of um, intensity depending on what the moment needs Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we talked a little bit about using motion in your training. I know some people uh, may have a challenge with that. You know, if, if you are, have mobility issues, then you need to have some other skills, some other tools in your tool belt. And that's what we're all about, figuring out what works best for you. Now, obviously, dog training is nuanced. Everything, e- each dog has some specific needs. Um, we've sort of pub- published generalized videos with mm-hmm. rather specific, you know, generalized um, instructions on it's YouTube. It's going to work for most everybody. It's going to work for, yeah, everybody and never put anybody in a dangerous situation. But, um, you know, if you are, if you do feel like you have a unique dog and nothing on YouTube is helping that, or if you feel like you have unique challenges yourself, that's where we specialize with things like our in-person and our online training. Maybe we can talk really briefly, briefly about, uh, you know, what we could, what, how we help those people with yeah. catered. Yeah, yeah. Ken said, we definitely um, sort of show a general thing on YouTube. It's sort of like a little snippet into sort of the bigger picture. But what we're really able to do with our um, programs, whether it's in person or whether it's online, is once we get to know you and your dog a little bit more, we're able to tweak things to ensure that you and the dog are really making specific progress because we know that there is not one way to train a dog. You know, you have to kind of figure out what works for each individual dog and person. Generally, things are very similar, but you know, there's a few tweaks that I would make for, you know, smaller breed dogs or large breed dogs or dogs that are maybe a little bit more nervous or anxious in temperament or maybe dogs that are like wild and crazy in temperament. Um, We're able to kind of make those tweaks and help you to kind of learn your dog a little bit more and and know what to do. Um, And also it's it's human dependent. You know, often we joke about the fact that, you know, we're McCann dog trainers, but really we're McCann people trainers our job is to teach you how to be a dog trainer so that when you're not in class with us or you know speaking with us online you are able to make good decisions for your dog because you understand a little bit more about how your dog thinks how to motivate them and how to be consistent so it's really about the big picture and we're able to do that when we are uh, working with you um, more independently inside our programs the amount of times we're actually therapists and or marriage counselors as well Uh, we settle marriage debates all 
all the yeah, time. Yeah, <laughs> let us know if, if like your spouse is one of your greatest challenges because this is a common thing that we talk about and uh, that requires, you know, a little bit of a different approach. But um, once everybody understands the why behind all the big picture and gets to see some results, then, uh, you know, people are, 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 the whole family gets involved and yeah. is more invested in the training. Talking about uh, moving on from motion, talking a little bit about what are some what are some other things like you need if you're out there training your dog, you never exactly. know what's coming around the corner. You never know what the next distraction might be. You never know when you're going to encounter something where your dog's just not sure what they should do next. This is where something like your voice, using your voice in your training can be so valuable. I was walking through one of our uh, life skills one or manual life skills two halls the other day during the day. And um, it's funny, it, guys, we're bad for this. I don't know, uh, you know, if you're watching at home and uh, you are a guy and you are thinking, boy, uh, my dog just doesn't really like to listen to me that much. This it part of it might be you're not using your voice enough <laughs> because the amount of students, male students that I coached to say like, hey, Joe, like really like you're you're enthusiastic about this. Let them know, like really start to praise that great behavior. But most of the time it's like, good. Yeah, all right. Yeah, let's, let's go, buddy. Come on. Let's go. There we are. It's just not enough. And this is where you can, you know, connect with your dog. I'll, I'll never forget. I talk about the story a lot, but I was um, in my first couple of weeks of uh, training in Life Skills 1, and um, I was trying to figure out, like, what's going to get Deacon, my black lab, to connect with me. And I walked in, and because I was so early, I didn't know which, where I should sit, and we separate the room based on uh, uh, size. So I sat on the wrong side of the room, and Instructor Robbie... Yeah, yeah, dog size. Um, instructor Robbie said, like, oh, Ken, just you got to sit on the large dog side over there. And I stood up and I was like, well, I don't even really, I mean, I totally forgot what I was doing. And blah, I don't even remember what I said, but I said it in like a high bubbly voice in a silly way. And Deegan was walking in perfect heel position, checking in with me because that's probably the first time I'd ever <laughs> been interesting using my voice. I didn't, I wasn't using food. I was moving quickly in a busy environment, but my voice was the thing that locked her on with me. What I should have done, again, you know, I was a brand new student at the time, but what I should have done is acknowledged that and then rewarded her for the nice walking. I don't really remember how that, how, how it went, but I remember th Robbie saying, look at that, Ken, look right there. This is exactly what we need to get Deegan more interested, to get, De get Deegan more motivated. And uh, boy, oh boy, was she right. I'll never forget that. And as I coach students or when I would coach students in the Life Skills One, the amount of times I'm telling someone like, let's hear about it. You know, it doesn't mean you're just nattering away, walking down the street, but you're acknowledging the great position that your dog is giving you. When, when a distraction is coming toward you, what are you doing? Are you getting really quiet thinking like, oh boy, I better or be ready for this. Or tensing up on the leash, or which tensing is like up the on worst the thing to do. Absolutely. That's, that's sort of like the natural response. But after watching this episode of the train station, now you're thinking, what am I going to do? Do I have some high value food as we get closer to this distraction? Do I need to use my voice? You know, all of these things happen before you've lost your dog and you're going to be amazed at if you sometimes when you pass that point of commitment that that distraction goes right by and your dog's like, wow, you know, I didn't even I wasn't even interested in them because you rewarded me at the right time because I connected with you at the right time. So using your voice in it doesn't matter what uh, recalls. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about using your voice in a recall, why it's so powerful. Yeah, I mean, you can give your dog um, immediate feedback as to whether they're right or whether they're making a poor choice, even when your dog's at a distance, all by using your voice. So if I call my dog to come, um, number one, how I call my dog to come can often, you know, make a change. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to sound loud and excited, like, you know, my dog's about to, like, miss out on a party. I don't want to be angry and intimidating. I, I want to sound like there's something fun going on. Um, and often what I'll see happen is people will call their dog to come and their dog will turn around and look at them. And then the person will stand there being totally quiet and the dog will right. go, oh, I get, are you not calling me? I guess I'll go back over here and sniff this thing because you're not getting much from you. So um, yeah, actually I saw Albert in yeah. the um, parking lot after his class and his voice was raspy. <laughs> and I was like, what's happening? He's like, I used my voice so much I practically lost oh, it in class. Great. And I was like, way to go. Um, anyway, so with the recall, um, I want to make sure that if my dog responds to me right away, I'm like, woohoo, 
good dog. Let's go. And I can use that running thing I talked about a second ago, praising my dog. Um, and the other thing you want to think about with your voice is that you can use it, elevate it to motivate your dog and get them to go faster. But you can also change your tone of voice to help your dog calm and be subtle. Totally. So once my dog gets to me, I want to be careful. I'm not like, sit, 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 and being, you know, animated and excited like that because I'm just going to send my dog's brain through the roof. Yeah. Instead, when they get close, I'm going to stand up tall and I'm going to tell my dog, sit, say it calmly, um, praise, good sit, that's better. You know, if I'm too animated and excited with my voice and my body language, yeah. my dog's going to match my energy and that's not the type of um, behavior I want when I get my dog close to me. I want them to come in and sit close to me and be calm and, you know, let me hook their leash on. So even without you know, perfect training in hundreds and hundreds of reps, just by using some motion properly and your voice properly, um, you can get a lot of success from dogs that haven't actually had a lot of experience uh, yet because these are all very natural responses that we're going to get for our dogs. You don't have to train them to respond to your voice, vocal tones in a certain way. They will react that way. So it makes such a difference. Dogs can tell when you're Genuine. Oh, yeah. Talk, they can really tell. And oh, yeah. um, I love seeing students that come in and, and or, or submit videos that are, uh, you can tell they've invested time in this dog. You can tell just by watching the video or standing outside the room listening to them, They their dog gets it too. You know, they're just so genuinely like controlled but excited about these wins. And those are the students that do so well. Mm -hmm. Also the same students that understand leadership from the very beginning. Like, yeah. listen, buddy, uh, I, this is great, but I don't really want you doing that. You know, there's no wishy-washiness. Hey, buddy, I asked you to lie in the bed. We need to go lie in the bed kind of thing. Um, and those students are fun. Those students are fun to train. And you, yeah. can, you can identify them pretty early on um, in, in a training session. Totally. But... As Kel mentioned, it does. It's not about being bubbly. It's not about being loud. It's about being you and about connecting with your dog. And maybe that's a gruff, grumbly, you know, low pitched, whatever, whatever it is. Find it and use it to your advantage. One thing that I see a lot of people do um, is either is is they'll often train to a point of failure. And whether this is going for a walk when your dog's in. A, you, Taking your dog for a walk and teaching your dog to walk are two different things. Yeah. So um, I want you to be really focused over the next little while as you're working on these skills and exercises with your dog that you're ending your training session with a motivated dog. Mm -hmm. This is especially helpful when it's something like the recall or when it's something like a skill where you want to like really crank up that energy. Um, <laughs> it, it also, f go ahead. I was just thinking of something again this week. I was teaching a lot more classes this week because one of our main instructors is off on holidays and I was covering for him. And um, there's just so many things that you say that I think, oh, I literally went through that this week. So I had a student today, um, say to me that she's been practicing her walking and that the dog is so good for like the first like five or ten minutes and then after that like the dog just gets distracted and um it happens like that like every single time the dog loses focus and I it was funny because Rather than answering her question, I had her put two and two together herself yeah. and answer her own question. That's helpful. And I said, okay, well, how often are you normally practicing? She's like, well, I'm practicing for like 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And the beginning's always great and the ending's always terrible. And I right. said, okay, yeah. so what could you do to make sure that you end with more motivation? Yeah. And then you could see the wheels turning and she was like, oh, I'm training too long. Yep. Great. Yes, you are. Oh, it's so um, great. Young dog, easily distracted. Um, you know, and that's really normal. It's it's really difficult to expect a young dog, uh, any dog really, depending on their how much training they've had, to give perfect attention initially for you know 25 minutes or whatever yeah. the time span is so it's always better to quit while um you're ahead and so my suggestion to her was you can practice multiple times a day but keep your training sessions to you know seven to ten minutes and then you know go and do something else and then that's later good. in the day practice another 10 minutes you can still do 25 minutes a day if that's what you want to do yep. but break it up into smaller spurts so that the dog is learning to um leave the training session wanting more to say oh man you're we're done already 
this was fun. That's how you want to end the training session so that the next time you bring them out, they're like, woo, I know exactly what we're going to do. I love this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, it keeps a bit more engagement from the dog. And then that goes for any exercise that you're doing, not just walking. Let me know what, what's your average training. What's the length of your ad- average training session? I know a lot of people will say, uh, well, you know, I get I work from this time to this time. I only have this time in the end of the day um, or whatever after dinner or before we, we have dinner. Uh, I'm here to tell you that it's going to be in your best interest to wake up earlier, um, you know, set a schedule, g- train your dog before you go to work if this is the case. I mean, this is different for everybody, especially mm-hmm. if all the people work from home now. But train your dog in the morning before they have their breakfast or whatever. Uh, train your dog when you get home from work, but just short sessions and then maybe one before bedtime. I mean, I don't know what... It looks like in your household, but um, I'd love, I'd love to know what your average length of your training session is right now. Five minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. What is it? Mm -hmm. Um, You talked about something there. Darn, I lost it. And I really liked what you were talking about. While you're ahead, keep things short. Do Keeping the dog train motivated. More than one training session in a day. Yeah, it was. Uh, um, so let's let's dive into this. Sue K, one of the Heart Dog team, uh, asked, uh, for example. If you're training a stay or heel and you want to end with a bit of tug or some other fun thing, great question mm-hmm. because there are times when certain rewards are less appropriate unless you can figure out a way to work it into your training. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So for walking specifically, I could definitely integrate a tug into the training, but I would do it at a specific time because what will happen when we're trying to teach walking, for example, we're trying to reinforce our dog for being in a specific position at our side. And if my intention is to continue continue walking and I'm trying to reward with a tuck toy most dogs when they go to bite on a tuck toy are going to move out of heel position they're going to start tugging and having fun so I might use uh, treats while I'm continuing my walking but maybe if I want to do a you know a 20 foot span or a five foot span or whatever amount of time then what I could do is pinpoint great position and attention with my word yes and as long as I've said yes I can allow my dog to break position and I can have a couple moments of tug and play. And then I'm going to put my tug toy back in my pocket. All right. It looks like to shove it down the back of my pants and cover it with my sweatshirt or my shirt. Which is why our puppy tugs are so valuable. It is. You can shove it down there easily and then it's out of sight for your dog. And then I can get my dog in at my side and go for it. You know, another little short spurt. And then I can, yes, mark that behavior. And then I can get the toy out because I want to make sure that I'm not, um, blurring the criteria uh, for my dog based on the reward that I'm using. I want to make sure that I've clearly said we're going to break off and have this awesome game of tug because you're walking glued to my side, yeah. nice and close. You're giving me good eye contact, which is why the timing of the yes is so crucial. So you can definitely use toys, but you need to use it in that, that way. You know what else makes me think of I did that a lot with Euchre, that dog that wasn't that oh, food 100%. motivated. I did a lot of walking training with exactly which I, I just explained, and it was so helpful. Let's talk about, there's two things I want to talk about. Number one, the most uh, obvious is the people who struggle with fetch fetch or retrieve training that will throw the ball until the dog just is like lies down. Yeah. Um, make sure you end on a win. You know, if you discover that your dog will do four long retrieves and then on the fifth, they're going to lie down or they're going to re- return more slowly or whatever, then make sure you are, maybe the fifth one's really close mm-hmm. or set yourself up. So your dog, you're, you're ending on these wins. How do you end on a win if your training has fallen apart? I mean, the, I don't want to get, it's hard to be like a, have a general statement, mm-hmm. but let's talk about a couple of specific in, instances yeah. where uh, like, oh man, this skill fell apart. How are you going to end on a win? Because you need to end on a win when you leave that training yeah. session because you don't want your dog to start thinking like, huh, if I just lay down, I don't have to do anything. I can yeah. do whatever I want. Yeah. So if you feel like things are going south and you don't think that, you know, whatever you're working on is you're going to get that get that little bit of success that you're hoping for. You don't want your training uh, exercise to quit right there. Um, But I would quit that particular skill. Instead, I might switch gears and change to something that I know my dog can do well before I finish. So that as Ken said, I can end on a win. I might change um, exercises completely. So if I'm trying to get walking and my dog's just had a bit too much and they're not having a, a good um, training session, they're not focused, then I might just finish with, you know, 10 seconds of sitting at my side or like a quick look at me or 
something even more lighthearted, like a shake a paw, yep. something. Or maybe I'll say to myself, okay, I've been out at the end of the driveway here for 10 minutes. This is not going well. Maybe I'm going to book it inside and walk up and down my hallway. I'll do the same skill, but I'll go walking. Um, but I'll go up and down the hallway where I lessen the distraction. So I'm ending on something positive that where the dog can be right um, to end that session. And you need to know your dog. If your training sessions are always ending with it not going well, yeah. You need to evaluate what you're doing because I hate to tell you it's not a dog problem. It's a tra- it's a trainer problem. So I need to think about what can I do differently when I'm training this dog that can allow me to have more success. Do I need to switch the reward that I'm using? Do I need to um, you know use more voice? Do I need to go further away from distractions? There's always some type of variable that you can adjust to help you get that win. And um, but you need to be conscious of that because sometimes people get in the habit of doing the same thing all the time and they don't uh, adapt quickly enough and they let the dog be wrong too many times and when that happens the dogs will do one of two things they'll either shut down and they become um, worried or a little unsure about the situation and then they kind of want to move away or a if they shut down they can stress high and then they just check out completely and they forget that you're on the end of the leash so that's why it's important to make sure that your dog has enough wins that it keeps them wanting more Absolutely. Um, darn, I was focused on something else. Okay. Um, there was something that you said. Okay, uh, K-Beth Leck, one of the Heart Dog team, has mentioned something. Uh, they say, I'm a fast... W- oh, I like this. Right. I like this because you're right and you're not alone. Uh, I'm a fast walker, but my almost seven-month-old Border Collie is quicker than me. How do I keep him by my side? You're not faster than a Border Collie? I got some What's bad news. You? Yeah, you, 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 every dog is going to be likely faster than their owner. So let's talk a little bit about maintaining that position a yeah. little bit better. So remember, we're walking faster in a way to motivate the dog. We're not trying to walk so that we match the dog. Exactly. In fact, yeah. it's the other way around. Yeah. We train the dogs to walk to our pace. Yeah. So if we walk fast, they walk fast. If we change our pace and walk slower, we train the dogs to adapt to us. So if you're walking and you have to walk over a patch of ice or you're carrying a tray of Tim Hortons coffee. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. No, I got to bring those Tim Hortons <laughs> to a double game doubles in. while wearing a toque. Oh, yeah. Um, Bar down. <laughs> <laughs> then your dog learns to adapt to you. So um, we've done lots of different th- uh, whole topic uh, videos. Yeah, thank you. I, my streams. brain yeah. is. Um, so something that I would recommend uh, for you is maybe integrating some change of direction so that you can keep your pace up, but you're dictating the direction so that you're not ending up trying to outrun uh, your seven month old border collie, which I hate to tell you, you're not going to be successful at because they're speedy. Um, so try changing direction or dial it back. Just stop for a second and maybe work a controlled sit at your side in heel position and just work a couple moments of attention just to get the dog's mind frame settled again get a little bit more focus on you and then you can proceed with your walking again so um it's great that you asked that though because you know we did talk about walking quickly and how that can motivate a dog but there is um some guidelines with that we're not walking so quickly so that we're walking to the dog um it in fact is quite the opposite um yeah also a super important thing to keep in mind because a lot of people are that's probably one of the main struggles they have is my dog is pulling me everywhere. They just, I can't keep up with them. And if you think that the goal is to catch up with them or walk faster so that you're, you know, it somehow would influence them to slow down, um, you're gonna be in for some trouble. It's gonna be pretty tough. Especially when you have a a healthy, athletic, young border collie like uh, Beth did. There's nothing that makes me internally giggle more than when I watch people training their dogs and they're trying to do like leash respect or something and you literally just see the person think, look at my leash is so loose, but the person just moving to where the dog's going. So the leash is being kept loose but not because the dog's doing it, the person's just moving to the dog. And so the dog goes, hey, this is cool. My human just goes wherever I go. I can walk my my human right over to this free treat on the floor or whatever it might be. So um, (laughs) you do need to make sure that you're the one dictating the pace and dictating the direction so that they kind of know who they should be listening to. (laughs) So this is going to sound like it's set up, but it is not. If you've watched enough train stations, you'll know that... It can't be set up because I have no idea what he's talking about. Our team uh, team of uh, moderators um, have talked about dropping a coupon code for 
life skills, uh, life skills and puppy essentials. So ah. regardless of what your training is at, and you'll you'll know if you've been to a training stage before, this doesn't happen often. So I think uh, I think they're ready. If you they've mentioned if you put. Train station 0824 in the uh, coupon uh, space when you go to mccandogs.com and go and check out our programs, then you'll be able to join us live on Monday for some coaching calls. Nice. Like, have you have you thought to yourself, like, this is great. Uh, this tonight has been awesome. But um, what am I going to do on Monday when I've forgotten everything I watched in the video or on Sunday uh, when, you know, it, things change? Uh, get access to uh, help for professionals. Or what happens if it's like a Wednesday night at 7 o'clock exactly. and you just come home and your walk was horrible? Totally. What if you could jump on the computer and, you know, text one of your um, instructors in our support exactly. group? Exactly. And say, look what just happened. Help. Yeah. And we can do that for you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Instructor Alexis, $30 off of our either of our programs, whether it's Life Skills or Puppy Essentials, you'll get to join us on Monday for the live coaching call. And uh, you get get your training started right. Get that, get that advice that you need when you need it. Be able to understand the nuances of training your dog rather than the uh, the demo dogs that we get to share here on the YouTube channel. I'm pretty pumped about that. I love when these guys, because here's what it comes down to. You're asking good questions. Like we're excited to have you as a student. It, if we see that in the chat, not me, but if they see that in the chat, they, uh, uh, you know, our staff I decides feel like it. it's like that game deal or no deal where like the people from a behind are watching That's and right. then they're like, okay, That's totally what it is. I like this crowd. Yeah, we're yeah. going to give them a, give them a thing. Yeah. It's very <laughs> cool. Anyway, I wanted to make sure that you're aware of that so that if you uh, are uh, in a position where you are looking for some help and some advice mm -hmm. and want to, you know, uh, speed up your training, get, you know, be more confident in your training, that is an opportunity for you but if not if you're not in a position right now <laughs> to, to get the help find a new addiction in your life <laughs> yeah yeah that's we true. love you albert, albert yeah he's, <laughs> he is definitely a superstar yeah, that's Albert's right all our classes. actually i do want to say you know some I, some of you that are watching are from all over the place and maybe not close enough to be able to to drive to to our actual facility so of course you can train with us online but um something that we offer at our in-person school that i i actually shockingly just finding out that other schools do not offer is the ability to come in and check out our facility and watch yeah, our classes yeah, for yeah. free totally so if you're ever in the area and you want to check out our facilities we have beautiful facility indoor facility with multiple training halls and an indoor agility arena um 22 acres um it's beautiful but if you ever wanted to come in and watch a puppy essentials class or a life skills class or yeah, whatever um don't we don't allow new dogs to come in that that there but Family members, you're welcome to come in and sit in on classes and see what we're all about. And um, we'd love to have you if you're ever around. Ma Matangue says Brazil is in the house. Well, nice. we're, hopefully we'll see you on uh, their coaching call uh, from Brazil. Um, we actually had students from Europe. Where was that? We had a student. Was it a student or uh, just like a YouTube viewer uh, that came no, in? No, she's an online student. Online she's student? from um, the Netherlands. That's right. Came in from the Netherlands. Yeah. It was so cool to, to chat about like, she her She was visiting and, Canada and yeah. came to the facility to check it out. Yeah, it was very cool. Anyway, take advantage of that uh, coupon. If you are in a situation where you want to start your training, you can call our office and speak with one of our incredible trainers in the office and find out the right program for you. The five tips we talked about tonight to recap so that you're uh, absolutely aware of what changes you can make in your training. Number one, knowing that being outside adds, adds an extra layer of difficulty. Number two, high value food is good, but it won't fix everything. So keep that in mind. Number three, using motion, how to do it correctly. We talked a little bit about that. If you uh, joined the show late, definitely go back and check that out. We broke down a video or at least a little clip of a video to give you some insight on how motion can really change your success rate mm -hmm. with your dog, especially for a dog that's easily distracted. Using your voice, regardless of the situation you're in and your mobility, using your voice can uh, be a very effective tool in maintaining some of that attention and allowing your dog, uh, keeping your dog more connected with you, even in those really tough, challenging scenarios. And ending your training session with a motivated dog. Finish Quit with a while win. You're ahead. Finish with a winish. Because Kale loves the rhymes. Finish with a winish. Yeah. That's, that's really a what good one. That's hun. what we're aiming for here. Does your dog do you do you put music on for your dog? Well, if that's the case, we actually are working with some uh, digital music creators to 
make music specifically for dogs. We t- uh, did a lot of research and, and checked out a lot of the what's known about the impact of music on dogs. It was actually from a situation that we had with our own dog mm-hmm. while Happy. traveling. And uh, we, we uh, have been uh, chatting and working with some incredible people to make music specifically to help your dog, in, you know, if you're crate training, if they're home alone, if they're worried about th- thunder and, and, and those kinds of things. Or in our case, it was like heavy trucks. We were in a location while traveling. The heavy trucks were driving by, and it really unsettled one of our dogs. So we decided to come up with some music, and this music is for these kinds of situations mm-hmm. to get, to relax your dog. That's really what it's all about. So it works so well that oh, I so traveled great. to I travel all over Europe and the states and stuff for competing, and I always bring my iPad yeah. so that I can play yeah. the YouTube channel um, for my dog, even when I'm not even oh, home, because so it, it it works so well for her. And we're getting so many. Very cool comments from mm-hmm. people about the channel and how much it's helped them. And we love it. Um, anyway, so at the end of tonight's show, when I hit the uh, uh, end of show button, you're going to get an opportunity to go check the channel out. If you like it, hit the subscribe button. If you're looking for music, <laughs> we're also on Spotify, Apple Music, all of the music platforms. Uh, or you can check us out here on YouTube on McCann Dogs Music Channel. Now, with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight, the rest of my friends, well, that is up to you. 